We have been discussing earlier the rise of the novel and uh, the way novel can be defined as a form. And uh, today's uh, discussion takes from there to come finally to the author that we'll be focusing upon. There is one thing that I'd like to share with you with respect to some early novels preceded the emergence of this form in the 18th century England. So let's have a look at these early novels. Uh, the first one is John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress. This was published in 1678, which is the second half of the 17th century. And uh, as the title of the novel suggests, this is about the progress of a person. And uh, the person's name is not given, but, the, but who the person is, his identity is shared with the audience. So it's Pilgrim's Progress. And uh, pilgrim means that uh, somebody has been on a holy mission and uh, mission and uh, the person, both of them have to all the time agree. The person has to become uh, just a carrier of the mission. So once you think of a pilgrim, then you think of an individual who will be tending to develop and become rich from the point of view of consciousness and morality. That's why he's called a pilgrim and he's on a pilgrimage and he has is settled destination and towards that destination the person is progressing. So novel, it was not a novel in that sense in which we understand the term in the 18th century but definitely made way for the emergence of this particular form and it showed uh, the development of character, it showed the development of consciousness, it also helped us identify who the person was and to whom was he talking. So it's an actual character picked up by John Bunyan in the latter half of the 17th century and his progress is shown and as all of us know progress is not a long line along a road which is uh, easy to go on. Progress has a lot of hurdles on the way and the pilgrim has to negotiate those hurdles, avoid them, somehow overcome them, circumvent them and then go ahead. If the person loses the way, then that ends in failure and the progress stops. So it's a kind of allegory that is being understood by the reader when one reads it at two levels. One the literal level where the person is walking and the metaphorical level when he is learning more and more in his uh, trade with, in his exchange with processes of life. The second novel that pre preceded the emergence of the form of the novel is Robinson Crusoe. There is no pilgrim here, but there is definitely an explorer, a person who would like to go from one place to another. He would uh, reap benefits of experience uh, and finally he might land up at a place which he, has, he, which he had never heard of and uh, that particular exploration becomes a kind of a tale, it becomes a kind of journey and uh, it is very close to the progress word in the previous novel, in the, in the previous work of literature but then it is much more near the ground. There are no two levels, there is just one level, the level of knowing more and more about the world that is unfamiliar and you might have uh, to draw uh, conclusions for this from travelers who just go to a place and then they come back and they hold an account in their mind which they share. So Robinson Crusoe is such a person, he goes to an unknown place, he settles down there temporarily and finally he's back and when he's back he has his listeners, he has his neighbors who want to know where he went, what he did, what he saw and all this is shown and people are lapping up whatever information Robinson Crusoe has to share with them. So it's very interesting, much more interesting than the Pilgrim's Progress because that was a journey of a person who was uh, going to be a saint and this person is like us, like the ordinary people and therefore the apprehensions, the questions, the doubts, the suspicions that all of us have as in individual human beings those apprehensions are there in the case of Robinson Crusoe also and therefore this becomes a tale, not at two levels but at one level, the level of social reality. Then you have Jonathan Swift, it's wrongly spelled on the screen but it's Swift, Jonathan Swift and the name of the book is Gulliver's Travels. So what is travel in the previous two books? It's actually tra called travel here. So this person goes from uh, once again like Robinson Crusoe from one place to another but then it's a strange land that he's traversing. It's not an actual world. It's a world that is make-believe. So one will not call it a novel in the sense in which one can call perhaps Robinson Crusoe a novel or nearer a novel. It is something that is an act of fantasy. 
uh, you know, your mind can make you believe in certain things which are not actual, which are not real. But because you want to see those things either in a bigger form or in a smaller form, and therefore your mind is asked to imagine things which do not exist in reality, but which can be made with the help of imagination. So imagination is at work in Gulliver's Travels and this is a famous you know, work and uh, it's, it's so simple in its uh, language and in its approach that it becomes almost children literature and uh, you might have seen the abridged versions of this work for the 4th standard, 5th standard, 6th standard classes and people enjoy because they all want to travel around a dreamland uh, which is not there in reality but which generally tickles our imagination. So these three novels, they precede the novel that we are discussing and uh, then you know Jonathan Swift and then you come to the actual writer whom we are going to discuss. Henry Fielding's uh, Joseph Andrews is one novel that we can think of and uh, this was uh, 1742, very close to the novels that we have already talked about, came in, in the middle of the 18th century and uh, you know that uh, for the first time there is a novel which has the name of a character. So we generally don't have characters in the early novels, but in this early novel you have a character and the character's name is Joseph Andrews. Why a character becomes the center of attention in a novel? You can ask this question from yourself. So far as I am concerned, the story becomes more human. When you imagine the protagonist of the story, the character of the story in human terms. So here is a person whose name is Joseph Andrews and when you know that he is Joseph, uh, Andrews and his friends also will be known with, uh, by their names and therefore the conversations in the census novels become much more intimate. Finally you have Richardson's Pamela or Virtue Rewarded. Now just see that it's a very interesting type of novel uh, where the title suggests also the theme like Pilgrim's Progress it also suggests a theme and uh, this novel is one year earlier than Henry Fielding Joseph Andrews and there is a connection that's why I thought I'll pick up these two novels together. Uh, Richardson's Pamela is about a woman and she is a virtuous person and uh, she is not easily corrupted, she is not easily beguiled, even though she is a servant. She is from the lower classes and she is stationed in a family of high order. Even then, and there is a man you know, who is after her, he wants to uh, somehow you know, corrupt her, who wants to take advantage of her being a woman and all those things. But she is a virtuous woman and she doesn't like to a mix up with the boss and finally when she doesn't mix up then the person realizes his her value and therefore he proposes marriage to her and Pamela then gets married. So that's the story and uh, because she was virtuous and she withstood all the pressures from the boss earlier therefore her virtue is rewarded with you know marrying a person of the higher class. So you, you would see that uh, initially it was travels but finally uh, till the uh, middle of the 18th century writers had started focusing more and more on characters, on human situations, on human behavior. And uh, if somebody was virtuous, somebody was not evil or, or somebody was not given to any kind of uh, bad quality, then you know the idea of morality and immorality also would become clear in the mind of the reader and that way the novel would become educative. Now this kind of information is important for us because then we can understand our major writer which is being discussed this and the next lecture in fact the next six lectures Henry Fielding is the person we are going to discuss and uh, let's have a look at him you know that uh, if uh, somebody is uh, known as a person and then as a writer then there is a connection between the person and the writer is there a connection between a person and a writer this is a question that uh, you might ask you know there is a lot of controversy in the 20th and 21st centuries where people say that the writer is important the person is not important and uh, their argument is that uh, you know only the writer, you know the words that the person wrote and uh, that is what is to be focused on, where he lived, why he wrote, what his family was like, what he read uh, in order to prepare his writing, that is not important for understanding his writing. That's the new approach but one may also believe that if you know about the writer as a person, the way he lived his own life, then perhaps you can know and understand the problems that he is presenting in his writing. Anyway, there are two views and if you, I think that it is it helpful to know the writer as a person also if the information is available. And we have the personal information of Henry Fielding is available with us and therefore I thought that it will be beneficial for us to know the kind of person he was and then we can connect the person with his writing. So let's see, he is born April 1707 and the place he is born in is 
شہر فرام پارک سامرسٹ شہر دیٹس دا پلیس دی بگر یو نو علاقہ اور ایریا آف انگلینڈ ویئر ہی لیوڈ اینڈ ہی از بورن آن دی اسٹیٹ آف ہز میٹرنل گرینڈ فادر ہز نانا فار فار دیٹ میٹر سو اسٹریٹ اوے یو کین آسک یو کوشچن فرام یور سیلف وائی ڈیڈ ہی ناٹ اسپینڈ ہز ٹائم ود ہز گرینڈ فادر اور ود ہز فادر اور ود ہز مدر اینڈ وائی میٹرنل گرینڈ فادر اینڈ آئی تھنک دیٹ ول گیو یو اے کلو آف کلو ٹو ہز پرسنالٹی دیٹ دی پرسن گاٹ اٹینشن فرام a particular set of care relatives and that would have made him more you know amenable to affection because maternal grandfathers give a lot of affection to children and uh, he must have been given all the freedom all the liberty to go wherever he liked read whatever he has to or even write what he has to so there is a kind of indulgence that that you know one has one enjoys uh, in the company of grandfathers generally and maternal grandfathers particularly So Fielding is brought up, nurtured by his maternal grandfather in a corner of England. And he is a high-spirited youth. The people saw him, they wrote about him, and they say that he was not petty at all. Uh, he would always, you know, talk about high things. And he would, high-spirited also means that he would be uh, outgoing and he would be helpful to people. And uh, he would be a jolly kind of a person. And uh, he would be a nice company. So that's the kind of person Fielding was. And uh, physically he was tall, uh, mentally he was witty, he, he could play with words, he could bring out two or three uh, hidden uh, word, uh, meanings in a word, and he was humorous. He could also crack jokes. So that kind of a person, what would he write? Just imagine. I think such a person generally would write comedy very well. And uh, he'll uh, talk about mixing up with people. He will not keep uh, secrets or mysteries to himself. He will always go out to meet people, to help them, to know about their ways, to, to, to show some kind of uh, curiosity, to understand their character. And such a person definitely is going to be a writer who will be writing not about himself, about what goes on in his mind, but about what goes on in the world that he inhabits. So that's the kind of person Fielding is for us. He in started his career as a playwright. Now this is important for the author that we are going to discuss that he doesn't start as a writer of novels. In fact, uh, there is no tradition of uh, writing novels at that time. As I told you, that in the previous 50 or 60 years, only a few uh, important works which were nearer the form of the novel were written and uh, we have already talked about them. But then he started his writing career with a play. What is a play? All, all of us know what a play is. A play is to be staged, play that, that has action on the stage. the play where characters come together and they talk in person there is a character in the book but there is an actor on the stage who is uh, playing the role of that character in the book and that uh, it's a very developed technique of a developed form of the novel uh, of, of literature of writing and uh, fielding started his career as a playwright as a writer of plays now just see he writes about masks or he writes masks what are masks it's the literary form Uh, it's a kind of a fairy tale kind of a thing. Uh, people, you know, uh, would sing and dance and, and talk in a stylized manner and uh, they will not talk in real terms, that they will not discuss things in real terms and mostly it will be a dance sequence. And that dance sequence would go around uh, a, a popular a tale that will be there at that time. But then you can make lots of experiments in the dance sequence and you can show some people in bad light, some others in good light. You can make the audience laugh at the follies of characters in a mask. So all these liberties are allowed in a mask and a fielding. A young man, he writes this mask at the age of uh, 21 years. So he would be college going at that point of time and uh, he would be playful and he would organize, you know, some kind of a dance sequence on the stage. That's how he enters the career of a writer. At the University of Leiden in Netherlands, he studied classical literature. that you know widens your horizon of understanding if you have read classical literature then you would have known about what literature was in the early years of human civilization classical literature is that which has stood the test of time four centuries five centuries even a millennium and more and then you know through classical literature the way people at that time enjoyed and celebrated the way they became happy and they were generally together how language was used what kind of facilities did you know writers have at that time in the classical period which would be around 10th century and maybe even 5th century bc classical literature in uh, europe is available that particular one which is 
written in the BC. So our writer was well versed in classical learning and literature and that I am sure stood him in good stead. Uh, he could make use of it very well and then he could in fact appeal to both the scholar and the ordinary reader. He returned to London from Netherlands, from Holland in 1730. At that time he is 20 years. So he has done his classical learning. Initially he is active as a playwright for seven years which means that is a training period for him. Uh, people today would not be reading uh, Henry Fielding for his plays, but then you know that uh, there is a kind of training that he goes through by writing plays in the beginning and these plays will equip him with skills of presenting characters in a lifelike situation. If you write novels just without this kind of a training where you have made people talk on the stage, where you, know, you have different levels of understanding of language, then of course your account, your description would be poorer communicating with the audience. So he wrote masks, farces, comedies. These are all forms, you know, which are stylized farces where there is a lot of criticism at the level of jokes and the, the jokes are far-fetched. The, the, the jokes are uh, unbelievable and yet you know you laugh uh, with the jokes and at the jokes and definitely jokes are at the cost of certain people. Who knows when a farce is shown, one's neighbor is not shown and it, it's not serious literature but you know historically speaking if this is how people enjoyed themselves in farces and in comedies and uh, comedies were quite old as a part of the tradition. So comedies, farces, masks, they get mixed up and when they mix up then a person like Fielding learns a lot from them. Burlesques. Burlesque is a story uh, which, which is high sounding where the jokes are mixed with serious intent where, they, where the main purpose is to celebrate, to enjoy, to create laughter and a sense of fun and uh, when you come out by watching a burlesque on the stage then you come out laughing and you become more affable, you become more better mannered, you start uh, gossiping with friends and uh, you, you start you know searching for the hidden meanings in a burlesque in a writing which appears to be fun but in that fun there is a lot of mimicry there is a lot of non-serious references and uh, that is very enjoyable at the level of literature particularly in his case Henry Fielding's case one burlesque titled Tom Thumb became famous naturally when he, at the age of 23 uh, when he writes this burlesque and he was writing about controversial matters he was talking about politicians he was talking about those who wielded influence in England at that matter of time and he might have rubbed them on the wrong side. He must have shown them in poor light and the very name of the person whom this writer has used for the title is called Thumb. Now Thumb is not a very sophisticated name for a person. Of course, you, it is the kind of a greeting there with us in India today. You show the thumb and that means and it's called thumbs up which means that uh, everything is fine but then uh, it has a meaning which is non-serious. And uh, the non-serious theme with a non-serious title of the work in which the theme is pursued, this sometimes can be extremely you know, interesting and because of which people must have thronged to the hall to watch this particular burlesque and uh, uh, Henry Fielding became famous with that particular writing. Two political satires, Pasquin and the Historical Register for the year 1736. See the titles, first is Pasquin, Pasquin would be a name of a character and uh, the other one is uh, rather risky to say, to present. Historical register you are presenting for the year 1736. You are living in 1736, you are writing in the 1736 and in fact you are showing the people on the stage who also live at the same time. Which means that people will come to see whom he has discussed, whom he has portrayed, and with what approach and understanding he has approached. So if, if your neighbor is shown, if your political leader is shown on the stage in a form in which he or she can be easily identifiable, mostly he, because men were there on the street and people knew them. Therefore, politicians and uh, important uh, writers of the, of the time, they would be targeted through a historical register. And uh, you know, the, uh, it, it's not funny. And it's a very serious matter when you use the word history, which means you are telling the truthful reference in, in, in the book. And therefore, he might have some friends, but he must have earned lots of enemies. Because when you show historical register of a particular year and you are uh, taking names and you are depicting characters, then definitely people will watch it with, with that kind of uh, understanding. And therefore, and rightly so, somebody can be angered. So uh, he was bringing in basically the characters from a big government, 
Now, what is a Whig government? Now, there are two political parties, very ancient from today's point of view. They were there in the latter part of the 17th century onwards, and they were there in the, uh, till the 19th century, after which other words replaced Whigs. So, Whigs generally were people who were loud-mouthed, very persistent on their arguments. They, they would argue with everybody, and they were reformists in general, and uh, they must have uh, themselves become laughing stocks. And uh, the Prime Minister of England at that time was Robert Walpole, he was a Whig leader and uh, Henry Fielding is satirizing him, is criticizing him indirectly. So he became angry with Henry Fielding and all but London theatres were ordered closed. Because if the theatres are presenting the Prime Minister of a country from a satirical angle, then the government will take action and that action will, you know, will be detrimental to the growth of literature because literature then becomes difficult to handle for the authorities. So Fielding's career as a playwright ended with it. Following it, Fielding studied the law and was admitted to the bar in three years. Another thing, first, he does classical learning. Second, he has a training in writing plays. And third, that he has legal knowledge. So he can be a magistrate, he can be a lawyer, and that will take him in, uh, to the company of uh, the big wigs in the country. And uh, that will also help him write with that kind of precision that is required uh, by a lawyer. So he has studied law and uh, less than three years in fact, he just becomes a member of the bar and there he will become important for his life's purposes. In his political journal, the champion it was called and the journal was there for two years, 1739 and 1740, the first of the four years. So this is the kind of editing that he has made a part of his career. So he edits journals at that time, one after another, and there are four. And uh, the champion is the one that uh, people still remember uh, having been edited by him at that time. He continued to criticize the Walpole government. Walpole government, for all its, you know, ferocious uh, statements and pronouncements, for the kind of noise they made and the kind of superficial things that they would be talking about, and nobody will take them seriously. Then definitely there were ordinary masses and they would think that Walpole and his supporters would carry out certain wishes that, that these people generally think of and therefore Walpole would have been an important political leader in the 18th century and uh, this person is uh, seeing, you know, some kind of holes in the, in the behavior of the Walpole government and therefore he satirizes him, he criticizes him indirectly. Then you know, because theatres are closed down, there is very little scope for the plays, uh, he changes tack. Now he will be writing uh, not plays, but he will write novels. So at the mature age of 33, in 1740, he turns towards writing novels. Uh, you know that uh, a person with this kind of a knowledge, with this kind of understanding, mature understanding in the world of arts and society, he starts writing a novel. So he is going to be socially very relevant. What does he do? He carries his satirical streak in the first novel that he attempts. It's not a novel, it's a spoof. It is just a kind of, you know, joke at the cost of a writer who has written a novel and I talked about this novel initially. It's Pamela or Virtue Rewarded and Fielding somehow used sarcasm to criticize uh, Richardson's novel Pamela in this particular thing. It was not a novel, it was just a 20 page kind of a thing and uh, it was more in the in, in the manner of what is called spoof here, uh, just that it should, should not be taken very seriously but then uh, he is cracking joke at the cost of Pamela, the writing. Fielding's was an unsigned pamphlet, obviously it's, it's a short thing and uh, he doesn't want to be recognized as the writer of uh, that particular pamphlet, therefore he didn't sign it but it was done by him and uh, there he had criticized Richardson's Pamela. So a person who starts with criticizing a novel by a fellow writer will very soon start criticizing many of the tendencies of behavior of the people around him and therefore the novels would be born in the true sense of the term with his efforts. So the attack on Richardson was continued with the novel The History of Adventures of Joseph Andrews. This is the first novel proper that he writes and uh, of his friend Mr. Abraham Adams. So there are two characters appearing, figuring in the title of the novel and this novel is published in 1742. It was more than a parody. Fielding considered it hitherto unattempted in our language. So he says it's the first novel and uh, rightly so perhaps because the writer saying that such a thing has not been written and we have to now vouch for the authenticity of the statement because a, something like this English readers had not seen so far that there is a person, that, that then he has a friend and then they move around 
and once again there are lots of uh, mistakes that they make and then I'll discuss it in the next lecture the particular thing that he said about the novel form it, by defining it and he used the word comic epic poem in prose we'll discuss it in, in the following lecture because that is what the new definition of the novel became in the 18th century following his wife's death he had gout and was severely crippled this gave him a sense of desolation even as his law practice did not give him sufficient sustenance so that's a kind of a health problem with him he is in his late 30s or early 40s and this is a time when he has to sit back then he has to think of serious things and then he takes his novel writing also seriously this time particularly however was when he was composing his fictional masterpiece so he was ill he was disabled he was crippled and he had all the time in the world to go through his uh, imagination and his mind about problems that he might have seen earlier in life and try to understand them so his fictional masterpiece the best work that he was supposed to write and uh, we will be discussing this novel only and that novel is called history of tom jones a foundling this novel appeared in 1749 so i close uh, with, with this observation that we come to the end of uh, the writer writer's career as a playwright and as a person who has uh, known about his world uh, from close quarters and now he will be starting uh, on a different footing and he will finally establish himself and his credentials as a writer of the great book called history of tom jones in the second part of the lecture in the second lecture in the next lecture i will be discussing certain aspects of this particular novel because that is what we have aimed to come to in the final analysis i hope you enjoyed the lecture and think about the points that i have made and uh, the next lecture that comes will also be interpreted in the light of what we have so far shared with one another thank you